Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next speaker is um, uh, Jatin uh, Aurora from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And it'll be the first of two talks about uh, efficient functional programming. Uh, and Jatin will be t uh, talking about uh, uh, efficient parallel functional programming. Does the audio, is any, everyone able to hear me? Perfect. Good, so I'll start. So hello everyone, my name is Jatin Arora. I'm coming from Carnegie Mellon University. And today I wanna tell you about some of the work that we have been doing to make parallel functional programming more scalable and efficient. And here by functional programming, I mean functional programming with arbitrary mutation. That's what the effects on the title means, and not like in a purely functional sense. So researchers have proposed parallel function, uh, functional programming for parallelism because it offers you so many tools to like make sure that your program is correct. Um, first, you can write express parallelism using these higher order bulk operators like map, filter, reduce which express a natural opportunity for parallelism. And then you can like think of them as if they're, uh, for correctness purposes, you can think of them as if they're executing sequentially. Functional languages also allow experts and library writers to uh, use all kinds of effects, non-determinism, concurrency, and other performance magic tricks uh, to implement efficient data structures that they can then hide behind abstractions so that you don't have to reason about them every time you use them. And last important thing is immutability and uh, parallel programming in general are a good fit because it makes, your, uh, makes the parallel reasoning about your program easier. And furthermore, when you want to break immutability and like introduce effects for uh, performance reason, you can do so after considering them and like basically accounting for them in a, in a very, like, in very specific location so that they're not spread out around the program. So all of these reasons make functional programming a good fit but the looming question somewhere in the back is that uh, can parallel functional programming compete with the fastest techniques out there? And the main problem in, when it comes to the performance of parallel functional programming is one of memory. So we all know that functional programs allocate at a very high rate. And this already high rate multiplies many times when many threads are demanding memory at the same time. So in order to keep up with the demands of these uh, parallel threads, you need to basically parallelize garbage collection. Just to illustrate my point, uh, I've drawn spools on my slide taken from the Keynote software. Um, and each spool denotes a thread. Alongside every thread, I've drawn like a thread local heap uh, using a gray box, which denotes the allocations that, are, that every thread has made. So now if the memory were this simple, we would have perfectly parallel garbage collection. And the reason is that each thread could independently collect its memory on its own, and we would, we would be fine. The problem is that in real life programs, you have these inter-heap pointers between these heaps, which introduce dependencies for garbage collection. So now you, ha you, want to you have to introduce some form of communication between threads in order to figure out these inter-heap pointers and garbage collect. So this is like, this is what harms, this is, the, this is his challenge for dealing with like parallelism in GC. Uh, people have proposed at a very high level two kind of uh, techniques to deal with these pointers. The first is called stop the world collection, um, where the idea is when you want to garbage collect, you pause all of the threads in your system, and then you figure out the roots, and then you, uh, then you basically do parallel GC. And then once the parallel GC completes, you, resume, uh, you ask the threads to resume program work. And there are many spins on this idea which reduce the pause times or be, maybe delay the, or maybe make the collector concurrent or any, some things. The fundamental commonality is that there's a lot of synchronization overhead you have to pay for each time you stop everyone. Um, and the synchronization overhead, A, scales, I mean, does not, I mean, grows worse with the number of processors. And B for functional languages, right, which collect garbage at, which generate garbage at a very high rate. Uh, you want to garbage collect very often, and like so inserting so many synchronization will basically kill parallelism. The other technique that people have come up with is called promotions, 
where the idea is that you eliminate these interheap pointers by copying objects to a shared global heap. So any time that you're about to create an interheap pointer, uh, the system will have like a read barrier or a write barrier that will detect the creation and copy and like basically copy both the participating objects to a shared global heap. And when you do that, you also have to update the old pointers that point to the old objects to point to the new basically copied objects. The problem with this is that um, you basically have to scan the heap in order to figure out all the pointers. So a read or a write could trigger a garbage collection which uh, amplifies the work cost. So if your program executes W amount of instructions, you may end up paying W square amount of overhead just to promote in the worst, in the worst case. Uh, so promotions, you cannot, bond the, you cannot reason about the cost of promotions and that's why promotions are not, good, not a great fit for parallel garbage collection. So a like the common thing between both these designs is they treat the world in a very flat way. But as I hope we all are comfortable with is that the world is not flat. Um, so what we do in our design is we arrange these heaps in a hierarchical fashion. And the, so in Maple, uh, which is the language that we are working on, uh, we, we are focused on fork join programs. And what we do for fork join programs is that we arrange these heaps according to the spawn tree of the, spawn tree of the program. Um, the idea is that the internal nodes of this tree are suspended and the leaves are executing in parallel. So just to like illustrate all this, uh, I've drawn a tree on the slide. In this tree, the heaps A and C are suspended. They are waiting for their children to join back. And threads B, D, E are executing in parallel. They are allocating memory in parallel. OK, so now that we have done all of this, what we realized is that most of the interheap pointers are actually simple. So let me elaborate on what, why they are simple. Um, so you can classify interheap pointers into three kinds, up pointers, down pointers, and cross pointers. And, you, and we can observe that up and down pointers are always associated with a paused thread. So for example, if you see the up pointer from heap B to heap A, it, so a pointer starts at some heap and always targets an object in a paused thread, similar because A is paused. Similarly, a down pointer always starts at a paused thread and goes to some goes to some heap. So the point is that garbage collector can deal with these pointers because it knows that one of the threads is always paused. Uh, and we, in our prior work uh, with Sam and Umut, uh, we have basically designed uh, provably efficient techniques in order to deal with these uh, up and down pointers. In this work, we focus on how to manage cross pointers, which are more challenging in some sense because cross pointers are between concurrently executing threads. Um, so it's more difficult for garbage collection because they may use the cross pointer to do something, like to maybe delete it or, in, or make more cross pointers or whatever. The first observation that I want to make with these cross pointers is that uh, the, the cross pointers are rare because in order to create a cross pointer, a thread needs to make a mutable update, and another thread needs to read that mutable update, which is a very rare programming pattern. It is used by, it is used by like, people mainly for efficiency reasons, but because it's so difficult to reason about in general, because it has concurrency and non-determinism, it is used rarely. So most objects in, the, in this hierarchy be, uh, is, are basically do not have cross pointers. And then what we do in Maple is basically we track these cross pointers using read barriers, and then we pin the target. So in order to deal with them, we pin the target object of the cross pointer. So just the thumb pin on this basically box D shows that the object, the target object of the cross pointer is pinned. The idea is now when a thread wants to collect its heap, it looks at the objects in the heap, it looks at which of them are pinned, does not move them, while it normally garbage collects the other objects. Another fascinating thing about these cross pointers is that they disappear after joins. So if you focus your attention on the cross pointer from heap E to heap D, when threads D and E join, it's going to disappear. Let me show you how. There is a lot going on in the slides. All I wanted you to focus on is the cross pointer from E to D. So suppose that, thread, uh, suppose that heap, uh, threads D and E join. What we do in our system is we track that join and we merge the heaps of D and E with its parent C. So now the cross pointer has just basically disappeared. 
And this is the idea. The idea is that you pay a one-time cost for pinning the target of the cross pointer. And then you wait, and, and then basically when, when, when threads join, it automatic, the, all of the overhead of having cross pointers just disappears. Uh, so we have implemented all of this in the Maple compiler for parallel ML. For people who are familiar with Maple, Maple only used to support disentangled programs, which is programs which only, contains up, uh, which only contain up or down pointers. But now with this uh, paper, we have modified Maple to accept all programs with arbitrary, all fork join programs with arbitrary mutation. And we really wanted to answer this question, well, how close like a functional garbage collected language like Maple can come close to like um, or like manually memory managed language like C++. So what we did to get a full scale picture is we implemented eight benchmarks in five languages, uh, like C++, Maple, Go, Java, and OCaml. And I'm showing you the results of that comparison by stacking the times of all the benchmarks on like one, so basically in this plot, the Y axis represents the time to run all the benchmarks and the X axis represent the languages. And this runtime it's taken on 72 cores. Uh, a few observations. So actually, Maple comes really close to C++. Its running time is less than within factor two of C++, which is great because these codes are implemented by the Parley Lib project, are ported from the Parley Lib project, and they're some of the fastest parallel codes out there. Uh, and then Maple runtime is fast, two times faster than Go and Java, which are state-of-the-art procedural languages, and 6x, which are also automatically memory managed and 6x faster than OCaml, which is a, a parallel functional language. Let's also look at the space numbers to get like a full picture. So the idea is the same. Uh, on the y-axis, I plot the space it takes to run all the benchmarks, and on the x-axis are the languages. And we see that Maple space comes really close to C++ and Go, which is great because it tells us like the parallel garbage collector is collecting all of the allocations that this functional language makes. And Maple space is also less than three times OCaml and Java. Now, <clears throat> the takeaway from this evaluation is not to nitpick between the languages. It's just a simple takeaway that if you have the right garbage collector, parallel functional programming can compete with the fastest codes out there. So I just want to uh, talk more, a little bit more about how we manage cross pointers returning back to that heap hierarchy. So the idea is that we so we manage cross pointers by, in terms of these things called entangled objects. An object is entangled if it is a target of a cross pointer. So, recall, so we, what we do is we track and pin entangled objects with the idea that a thread can, when a thread wants to collect its heap, it looks at the entangled objects, does not move them, while it copy collects or gar normally garbage collects other objects in the heap. And what we do to track entangled objects is we use a read barrier. So recall that in order to create a cross pointer or an entangled object, a thread has to make a mutable update, and then another thread has to read it. So we track, the, we, we track each read of the program and basically track entangled objects. A very important optimization for this design is that we only use read barriers on mutable objects. Now, so basically, there are no read barriers on immutable objects, which is very important for efficiency because most of the reads of a parallel functional language runtime are on immutable objects. Now, there are more details on how we skip read barriers on immutable objects in the paper, and I, I don't think I'll have time to go into them. Uh, but when, when a thread now wants to garbage collect, we also implemented a log-free collection algorithm to like, account for concurrent pinning. So what might happen is, as you garbage collect, you know a set of pinned objects at the start of collection, but some other threads might come in and pin new objects. So you want to have to deal with that concurrency. And these details I'll defer to the paper. Please read it. Uh, so an interesting challenge is, well, how do we manage or reason about the overhead of uh, basically managing these entangled objects? And to account for this, we proved a theorem which says that the total work of managing entangled objects is order epsilon, where epsilon is the total size of entangled objects. Um, the main takeaway from this theorem is that entangled objects, if you have them in the system, you pay a one-time cost, which is for pinning, and then it doesn't matter how many times you read them, how many cross pointers you make to them, there is zero cost. And the second observation to take away from this theorem is that disentangled objects pay zero overhead. Uh, which is because and which is great because like most of the most of the objects in your program are going to be disentangled, and just to test this out, we implemented a synthetic benchmark 
in which the number of instructions the benchmark uh, executes is the same, but we could vary the amount of entanglement it creates. So the y axis shows the time to uh, basically run this benchmark, and the x axis shows the amount of entanglement the benchmark creates. And we can see, like, the time for benchmark scales linearly, which confirms the theorem, basically, that the overhead is linear. Okay. So uh, we also wanted to test the efficiency of Maple on other benchmarks. So we have a parallel benchmark suite of around, uh, of a perf very good number, I think 26. Um, so, and some of these benchmarks are taken from graphs, uh, graph algorithms, some of them are numerical algorithms, some of these are actually concurrent data structures. And Maple gets good speed ups. It gets an average speed up of uh, 30x on 72 cores. Uh, I have highlighted some of them in green. So these green ones are entangled and the blue ones are disentangled. And on average we get 30 speed up. Uh, again, the takeaway from this slide is that if you were to write these benchmarks in C, C++, you would get similar speed ups. I want to end by saying like a one line summary on why, maybe more than one lines, but like I want to give you a quick summary on why Maple performs so well. It is because we tie the GC to the program. So what Maple does with its heap, high, heap tree architecture is that it gives the garbage collector information about the function of interheap pointers. So when, when we are garbage collecting, we know that a pointer is generated because of this reason, a down pointer is generated because of this reason, and a cross pointer is generated because of this reason. So the garbage collector is able to account for them differently and handle them very efficiently. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Any questions? Please step up to the microphone if you have questions. Hi there. Um, thanks for the very clear talk. This is uh, Adrian Sampson from Cornell. I was just cur curious in the results. It was surprising to see that the space overhead with respect to C++ was essentially nil. I, I guess like the, the folklore for GC languages says that they should have like a about a 2x space overhead to get comparable mutator throughput. I guess I was curious like are we, is that folklore wrong or maybe it's wrong in this parallel programming setting or maybe we're measuring footprint differently and just curious where that came from. That's a great question. So uh, this is like the max residency. Um, and this C++ allocate, the allocator in C++ was actually the allocator that Parle, the authors from Parle Lib wrote. Um, and they really optimized for time efficiency. Um, we tried switching a different allocator and like the C++ uh, space numbers went down without affecting time that much. But like the, uh, so, these, no, these C++ space numbers, I think you could improve them by 20, 30% by switching out the allocator. Just the engineering task of like changing their allocator to something else was uh, a little much. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the talk. I had a quick question about the performance numbers. I think it's in the previous slide. Um, when you said you implemented these, did you, or did you implement all these for the five different languages or did you use standard so uh, C plus, some of the C++ benchmarks were taken from the parallel lib, as I said. Other benchmarks we implemented ourselves. Um, we tried remaining faithful to like the data structures and the memory representations of all of them, but there are some fundamental differences between the okay. yeah. Yeah. languages, I mean, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, May Milano from Berkeley and Princeton. I'm having a little trouble telling from this graph, but are there any particular benchmarks where NPL is not doing significantly better than Go Java and OCaml, or is it an improvement across the board? I think it's across the board. If I, uh, I can have the numbers, just one second. I hope I have the numbers. Yeah, so this is like the full scale comparison. Uh, yeah, I think it's roughly across the board, it does better. Sometimes space fluctuates here and there, but yeah. Uh, if you'll indulge me one more question. Uh -huh. um, this is great for a fork join model. Have you given any thoughts to a more general concurrency model? Perfect. So concurrency model is a bit of a wide term. So we have thought about how we can apply these techniques to futures, which can do some limited form of concurrency. And actually with entanglement, with the fact that we allow for these cross pointers, um, maybe like so with futures, Com combined with like uh, this entanglement uh, with cross pointers, I think you can do a lot. So like we are implementing, we are basically working on extend extending Maple with futures. Thanks. Yeah. 
John Yu Shalmish. So you showed us benchmark results with 72 cores. I wonder, does scalability of performance vary between the languages that you benchmarked? So if you had run on one core, or if you'd run on two cores, four cores, or 10 cores, Thank would we have seen different results or similar results? So this is on one core. Uh, this is the numbers on single core. Um, and uh, Maple is a lot, like the gap between the languages and Maple is a lot smaller, which means that Maple scales better. Yeah. Thank you. On these benchmarks. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.